Shalom TV's coverage of the 2014 APAC Policy Conference is made possible in part by Naomi Vilko, MD, in memory of her father, William Vilko, and in memory of her other relatives who perished in the Shoah. the 2014 National APAC Policy Conference. I'm standing with Ari Shavit, and I have to tell you that there are many people here whom the audience wants to see. They don't want to see anybody any more than they want to see you. Incidentally, you know, you wrote this extraordinary book, My Promised Land. It has received an enormous amount of attention, and it has created controversy. And I was very curious, Ari, I don't know if, if you were, what would the reaction be of APAC people to you? And they were overwhelmingly positive, and you were just fabulous. And one day we'll sit in studio, we'll talk about your book. Right now I just want to talk about some of the topics you raised, but Kola Kavod, a fabulous, fabulous job. So look, you seem to be saying two very important things, and I want you to clarify it for the audience. On the one hand, you described how hard it is for Israelis to embrace the whole notion of peace given their history and what you call traumas that they've had. At the same time, there are very important things you believe Israel must do and the status quo, which includes occupation, the, continu the continuation of settlement building is something you believe has to stop. What I want you to explain is the extent to which you believe there is any possibility for a real peace agreement with a Palestinian people who I don't see and most of American Jewry does not see reaching out. When we hear David Pollack talk about the incitement that's going on inside in Arabic, when we hear Eth um, Nathan Sachs talk about the problems he sees, and then you also were very candid about all the difficulties, the obstacles that stand in the way. Before, you, before I ask you about Plan B, why do you have any hope at all right now that at this point in time, the Kerry Initiative, as much as you hope it works out, what, is there, what evidence is there for you that there is any possibility right now of some progress, some real substantive progress occurring between the Israelis and the Palestinians in a peace process? Shalom is a precious word. Yes. And uh, I've... It's a long time since I've been a naive peacenik. Yes. So my my belief in peace, I, I I yearn for peace. I'm willing to pay enormous prices for peace, as long not suicidal prices, but I'm. You know, I think it's uh, the pursuit of peace is a moral and political imperative for Israel. But I've never said that peace is around the corner. On the contrary, mm -hmm. I have deep doubts whether both sides, and mainly our neighboring Palestinians, can really recognize us and acknowledge us and accept the Jewish state mm -hmm. and, the, and, and really recognize Jewish sovereignty in the land of Israel. But what I think does not matter, because I do think that every Israeli prime minister must try again, as I said, we must try. Why? Because it's essential for Israel to capture the moral high ground. The problem is, let me say this, we are a small, lonely people. We cannot do what China does in Tibet. We cannot do what Russia does in the Ukraine. We have to be just and moral for our own sakes and for the world that is ambivalent about us. So it is if we are to have a future, not because I'm, I'm mm -hmm. no flower child. Mm -hmm. I'm not a child anymore and I'm not, definitely not a flower child. I see the harsh realities. I know how brutal history was. I know how brutal and deep the conflict is. I see how brutal the region is. I think all these things have to be addressed. But within that context, I think again that if 
we try out, if we reach out and try peace, there is nothing to lose. Absolutely. If, Absolutely. if peace will be achieved, great. If not so, the world will know and we will know that we did the utmost, that we turned every stone in order to reach peace. And then we'll deal with our destiny, with our fate, with what we have to do with more strength, mm -hmm. with more inner strength mm -hmm. and with a world that understands us much better. Let me say one thing that I think sure. people really do not sometimes forget. The great thing that Ben-Gurion did, and Ben-Gurion was no Mother Teresa, was that in 1947 he accepted the partition plan that was impossible in many ways. Because he accepted that, he captured the moral high ground which enabled us to win the 48 war, which was so difficult and to have international legitimacy. The same thing in a different sort of way Ehud Barak and Bill Clinton did in 2000. Had we not gone to the Camp David Peace Summit when the Second Intifada happened, when this terrible offensive of terror uh, uh, was after us, we would have lost. We would have been in trouble. So going for the moral high ground, reaching out and trying peace, there is nothing to be afraid of. If peace is there, fine. If it's not there, we'll be stronger in every way possible. Okay. But I just, you know, again, when we're together, I'll do, I'll do more into this. Just understand, I'm a liberal American Jew who grew up with the same kind of idealism about the state of Israel and liberal values, of Jew, both Jewishly and politically. And I have argued for years and years and years, the two-state solution is not... It's not about demographics for me. It's not about democracy for me. It's about fair. That the Jewish people have said since the 1930s, not the 40s, the 30s, we'll share the land. There are sure. two people yes, here. Sir. Okay, we would love the whole thing. We'd love both sides of the Jordan. We'd love from the West Bank. We'd be love from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean. But there are two peoples here. We will share the land because it's fair. And I believe that that has been the underlying Jewish premise. And you articulate it beautifully. And when I ask you the questions, it's not because I'm against this in any way. What bothers me is something you talked about in one of your sessions, realpolitik. And what bothers me at the moment is I don't see a realpolitik solution to this. Sure. And what you're saying is, and, and you can tell me if I've got it right, that what you're hoping for is Israel does everything possible to demonstrate to the world that it is ready to make any concession as long as it protect, uh, security is included, and that you feel that will win us the mo moral high ground, which at the moment, Ari Shavit is worried we are losing. Okay, and, and I think that people should understand exactly what you're saying. We'll go into it more when we have more time. I have one other question I want to ask you. You talked about, brilliantly, the problem of the younger generation. And you also did it by ages, which was very, very bright and wonderful of you. That yes, a 70-year-old Jew sees it one way because he's experienced the Holocaust, whether it was firsthand or not. The, the one who's over 30 was there with the 60. Or the 50 is Yes, there, but, but you, you changed the, the 50 and 30. But, yeah. but, but, but the, the one you, is under 30. Right. Is, if you matter. know the Six-Day War, you also feel differently. And if you don't, if you're 30, which was the age you... There's no context for this. And by the way, Michael Oren also spoke about this in a beautiful context when he said, when I was growing up, there was anti-Semitism in my community. We were part of the fight to save Soviet Jewry. And my father held up Life magazine with that famous picture of the Israeli soldier crossing the Suez Canal with the Israeli rifle. And my father, he says, kisses the picture. And Michael Oren says, I want to be that Israeli kid. None of these three things now resonate with the younger generation, all right? That's my point. Okay, and my, and my question for you is, as you're standing here, al regal achat in APAC, and you have the right to say to me, I don't know the answer, I only can identify the question because sometimes identifying the problem itself is of enormous value. If you have no answer, it's okay. But what you didn't tell us is how we energize the 30-year-olds and the 25-year-olds, and how, with, when they don't have Ari, the context that you have identified, sure. how do we reach them? Do you have any suggestions for yeah, us? I know very much. So. First of all, look, what I try to do in my book is to rewrite the narrative, because I really think that the, the, the problem, the deep problem that we face both in Israel and in this country is that we've lost our narrative.
So I tried to do my humble act of rewriting the, humble, the, the narrative in my own way, in a way that I think people can relate to and see the human story, not just see the politics and the history. I think that something like, like that must be done on a much larger scale. I think that two or three things needed to be done. One, Israel must change its ways on several issues like occupation and like some of the religious issues. So it is perceived as a benign, progressive, just Israel that young people who are progressive and have universal values can identify with. That's number one. Number two, Israel has to reach out to the community here. We do not only want you to support us there. I think I want us to be us to be involved here. I think we know, I do not see us sending shekels yet mm -hmm. to Washington DC, but I think we should see what are the problems of your community and help you dealing with them. Jewish education, Jewish summer camps, Jewish continuity in every way possible. But at the end, beyond these things, we must really go on the offensive. It's enough. We are being, on the one hand, too defensive, too protective of ourselves, not acknowledging our promise. My, love of my country, my belief in Zionism is so deep that I'm not afraid to tackle the dark sides of our history or the flaws in our political life. I think that when we'll approach the young people in this country, prove to them that Israel is relevant to them, that Israel is attractive. Why is it relevant to them, Ari? It matters for them because at the end of the day, there is no non-Orthodox Jewish existence without the Jewish national home in Israel. Unlike the old Zionist, I don't expect all Jews to go there and make Aliyah. If someone wants to do that, fine, but I do not urge. On the contrary, I think the Zionist duty of the day is to help strengthen the communities here. This is our role. But people have to understand, and I think if you talk to them, they realize it, that without an anchor, without this powerhouse of Jewish identity there, we face the danger of evaporating. We are as I said, we are a remarkable species and we are an endangered species. Now, young people in this country have difficulty realizing it because Jews are so successful, are so powerful. Israel is so successful, so powerful. They lost the context of where we have come and what are the challenges facing us. And what I tell them when I talk to them, I ask them to think of their grandparents and great-grandparents. Where were they? What has happened? And what you'll see when you think about it is you see these astonishing success stories these miracles, these Jewish miracles of creating Jewish sovereignty there and creating the perfect diaspora here. But both were made and succeeded because we helped each other. Mm -hmm. And both are now challenged and we shall survive and overcome only if we work together. So we need the young kids in the, in the, in the American campuses and the young kids in American campuses need us. And it's time we all understand it and work together. I told you, you were fab, fab, but there were so many times I wanted to jump up and give you a hug. I really feel in many ways you've been misunderstood and you are brilliant in your articulation. I want to sit with you in studio because I want time when I, re I really can dig in here. But I thank you, Kol Tuva and all you, you do. And just Ari Shavit here on Shalom TV. Thank you, my thank friend. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. At APAC's 2014 National Policy Conference, I have the great pleasure of sitting with Natan Sachs, who's with the Saban Center for Middle East Policy at the Brookings Institute. That's right. First of all, you were brilliant. Thank you very and much. And it was wonderful listening to you. And and Natan was part of a discussion which you'll see on Shalom TV with Avi Shalvit and David Pollack. I want to tell you what my reaction was, and I want you to give me some direction here. I'm listening to the three of you, and I'm saying to myself, there's not a chance in hell that anything of a positive nature is going to come out of the peace negotiations that are being worked on right now by John Kerry with the State of Israel and the Palestinians. Not a chance in hell. And I say to myself, all three of you talked about what plan B will be. And I want to preface this also by saying to you, and I'll say to them if I get a chance to speak to them. Because you identify a problem doesn't mean you have to have the answer. Sometimes identifying the problem in and of itself is a great help. So I'm saying to myself, I don't want to put you on the spot, you have to have the answer, no. But I want to know whether the answer you give me is, Mark, I don't have the answer. I want to know number one, is there anything at the moment, seriously, that you think would bring the Palestinians to a table when I hear all the things that are working against it, including the facts, and none of you addressed this, 
that Hamas and Fatah are not together. Right. Can there be, by the way, Natan, a peace agreement between the Palestinians and the Israelis that does not include Hamas? So the first answer is I'm not as pessimistic as you. I think it's a long shot. I think it's difficult. I think, by the way, the American leaders know this. Give me one reason why you're not pessimistic. Because neither of, the op neither of the sides have a very good answer to your second question. Their plan B is worse. And so, and since their plan... I'm, I'm sorry. Explain to me why the Palestinians are not absolutely happy to continue exactly as they are. What's their incentive? And Natan, I say to myself the following. If I were Mahmoud Abbas, and I really believe peace was in my interest, I wouldn't worry about settlements. I wouldn't worry about preconditions. I'd go meet with Netanyahu anywhere he wants, and I'll come to Ramallah, or I'll see you in Jerusalem, or we'll meet in Washington. He never says that. Tell me why you think the Palestinians feel that Plan B is so bad for them that they can't in endure exactly as it is today when they see the BDS movement working, when I hear Ari Shavit tell me how bad it is for Israel, it's on thin ice right now. Explain, explain to me why the Palestinians don't have every incentive to keep things going as is. Well, first, I don't think they necessarily, I don't think peace is necessarily likely, but I do think that the Palestinians face a much worse reality without it. Ali Shavit re regarded Israel on thin ice, but Israel's suffering is not necessarily the benefit of the Palestinians. The Palestinians remain under occupation in the West Bank for, to a large degree, and they remain curtailed economically and otherwise. And the reality is that Israel, despite its distractor, despite everything else, is actually doing quite well. And it's getting stronger, it's getting wealthier. It's now officially a member of the OECD. It's a developed country. We can now say that officially. In other words, Israel can weather this storm much better than the Palestinians, despite BDS, despite all the criticism. I don't think Israel should, but Israel can do it much better than the Palestinians. Now, that's not to say I think peace is likely, but I do think it is potentially possible. But to your question about if it doesn't happen, what's plan B? I don't have a full answer. I do think that it includes a very important principle. We need to be very true to ourselves in terms of our long-term strategy. So if our long-term strategy is partition of the land and not granting citizenship to, to the Palestinians in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, we need to act accordingly. We need to decide where we build, and in my mind that should be in Israel proper. We need to be able to say to the world in very clear terms why we are right and the criticism against us is wrong, and why we are not acting against our own words. Part of the problem is political, of course. If you look at the Israeli government, you have Prime Minister Netanyahu, who speaks very openly and clearly and now consistently about two-state solution, while you have the Minister of Housing, who literally demonstrates against that own thing and is building, of course, in East Jerusalem and the West Bank, in theory at least, completely against the whole plan that Netanyahu is, is, is accepting now. What this means is not that Israel is at fault. What it means is that Israel is shooting itself in the foot in two respects. First, it's undermining its long-term strategy, along which plan B should be aligned, even if it's temporary, even if it's unilateral, even if it's otherwise. It has to have a very clear strategic vision, and that, to my mind, is still partition and two-state solution. And secondly, it shoots itself in the foot by the terrible PR damage it does. It's very hard to say to, to, say to the world, we mean what I say about a two-state solution, and by the way, I'm going to build in where the other state's going to be. I told you before off camera, I want you in the studio. You're, you, you really are terrific. Thank you very much. I want to really, you know, I want to just get inside your brain. Thank you. Have you talked more to our audience? This is, uh, you know, a, a guy who has brought incredible insight into very, very complicated issues. And you stood here on this, you know, on this great panel and did a great Thank job. Thank you very much. Natan Sachs, we'll meet in, in studio. Great. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. Very much. Pleasure. I'm now standing with David Pollack, who's with the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Also a fabulous job. Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm listening to what you say, and I'm saying to myself, David, as I hear what you say, mm -hmm. as, as pained as it makes me mm -hmm. feel, mm -hmm. because I am a big supporter of the two-state solution. Right. Not for demographic reasons, not for democratic reasons. I believe okay. the Jewish community has always said it's the right thing to do. Okay. Okay. But I hear you talk about incitement in sure. Arabic. Yeah. I hear okay. you talking about the extent to which Abbas himself and Palestinian leadership right. has not done anything to build real bridges between okay. Israel and the Palestinians. And I say to myself, it's all blah, blah, blah. There's not a chance well, in the world um, of this okay. particular, yeah. in, at this particular point right. in time, mm -hmm. the Kerry Initiative bearing any fruit. 
and I want to know why in the world there's any optimism on your part. Well, I think... Be honest now. Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I would say that I agree with you that the Kerry Initiative is not going to result in uh, an agreement anytime soon, but at least it keeps the talks going. Yes, and that's yeah. good. Okay. And we always want to try, right? Right. Okay. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that I do think that over time, the Palestinian position and Palestinian attitudes have softened. And this is, they still, there's still a long way to go. And they are still, as I said, very emphatically giving out mixed messages. Yes. Uh, but, but even so, the underlying message, even to their own people, is one that accepts the, the necessity, at least for now, right, of a compromise with I'm Israel. sorry, that's not what I heard you say. No, no, I heard they, you say no, they no, want Haifa. Yes, I heard yes, you yes, say yes. that. Where's that, the accommodation that, that, there, that, David? That's why I said the necessity, at least for now, of a compromise with Israel. They have not gotten to the point where they're telling their own people that we are going to have to give up Haifa and Jaffa forever. Then what's, and why is this real? I'll tell you why. Because even after an agreement, Israel will still be strong and will still be capable of defending itself and proving over time to the Palestinians that they've gotten as much as they're going to get forever. And that's why the agreement if there ever is one, will have to be phased in, not all at once, and will have to be accompanied by some real changes in, I think, in the Palestinian messages to their own okay. people. Can there be mm -hmm. a real peace between the Palestinians and Israelis that does not include Hamas? Well, uh, I would say as a long-term proposition, well, let me put it, let me turn that question around and say real peace with Hamas is inconceivable. So, so, so why is this so, real? So the way to approach it is to make peace with the Palestinians on, on acceptable terms with the Palestinians who are willing to make peace and to leave Hamas in Gaza to stew in its own juices mm -hmm. until Someday, there's a new opportunity to get them out. At the moment, David, yeah. what percentage of the Israeli people are ready to accept a two-state solution under the premise mm -hmm. that there's a real peace? What's the percentage? On the premise that there's a real peace. Well, the, the percentage is about 60 percent. That's all? Yeah. I that's heard, I, but wait, I understand it's 80 mm -hmm. percent. No, no, So no, that no, when, no, you no. Said, it, 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 when you said it would bump it up 15 percent. Yeah, yeah, right, right. That's okay. right. You're that, saying that, 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 that by the way, I want to make sure us, you and yeah. I understand each other. Right. David Pollack is saying to me that at the moment, the yes. polls show that among Israelis who understand they're talking about a real peace, only 60 per 40 percent of well, the Israeli yeah, yeah. people are against a two-state solution with real peace? Because I haven't I, seen those numbers at I, all. I, I'm, I'm not familiar with questions that say real peace. Uh, there are questions that say a peace agreement or a, uh, a peace treaty or something like that okay. or a permanent. So real peace is a different question. But when you say that the Palestinians would be willing to accept a Jewish state, then yes, the percentage does go up from about 60% okay. to about 70 or 75%. Okay. Right. Last question, I'll let you go. Sure. Everybody on the panel talked about Plan B. Right. Okay. Except me. <laughs> I don't want there to be a Plan B. I only because, have one plan. Okay, and, and that I thought yeah. was a very interesting point on you. Right. Because yeah. is there really a Plan B? Well, there is, but it's not a good plan. What is it? And the, the plan B, uh, according to some of my very fine colleagues on the panel, is for Israel to do things unilaterally and to actually to make concessions unilaterally. I don't think that's a good idea. I don't think it's ever a good idea to make concessions unilaterally unless you get more out of it than you had before. And that's not what's going to happen. And do you believe the Israeli people are ready to make concessions for nothing in return? No, absolutely not. Absolutely, absolutely not. Okay. And, so that yeah. plan B just is not realistic. 
I think that's correct. Okay. Yeah. Look, one day we'll talk in studio, you know, and <laughs> okay. I'll have a time to just okay. grill you to death. We'll have plenty but of you, time. But you did a All marvelous right. oh, job, and it's so been a pleasure yeah. seeing you. Great. This is David Pollack right. here at the APEC <laughs> National Policy Conference. Thank you, my Thank friend. Thank you very much. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to Jem, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.